When Jesus Christ died, we died with him. Though he slays me, yet will I trust in him. Good morning. I'd like to welcome you this morning to Berean Bible Church. This morning we're looking at the second coming in Matthew. This will be part one and we'll do part two next week. You know, there's probably no topic that is debated and disagreed on more in Christianity than the second coming of Christ. And especially right now, you know, you got this issue in the Middle East going on over there with Hamas and Israel, and it's like, you know, Christians are looking at that and say, the world's about to end. You know, I mean, this is it. This is, you know, it's just all going to blow up. And it might just blow up over there, okay? But it's not going to be the world. And I think the reason that Christians are so confused on this issue is there is a real lack of understanding of hermeneutics within the church today. Hermeneutics is the science of biblical interpretation. And there are laws that govern how we interpret the Scripture. And, I, and most Christians probably have never even heard of hermeneutics. And so therefore, they just interpret the Bible like a newspaper that they got that day. Oh, look, I just got it. And they read it, and it's like, yeah, this is to me. Really? Where is the... Here's the book written to the saints at Tidewater, Virginia. Where is that book? So we have to interpret it in the light of its original audience. So for the next couple of weeks, we're going to be looking at what Matthew has to say and what he has to say about the timing of the second coming, because I think it's very clear in Scripture, again, if you just have a little understanding of hermeneutics. Now, the first two chapters of Matthew's Gospel deal with events surrounding the birth of Yeshua, who was the Christ. Chapter 1 shows that Christ is of the lineage of David and presents him to be the heir to David's throne. Chapter 2 presents the worship accorded to him by the wise men from the east who honored him with gifts befitting one born to rule. Now as we come to the events of Matthew 3, Yeshua is around 30 years of age. Matthew now wants to present us uh, the person who has the responsibility of introducing Yeshua as the Messiah to the nation Israel. After all, Yeshua is the King, He is the Messiah. As such, it's fitting He has someone to come along and announce Him to prepare the way for Him. So without any background, and, and this is the interesting thing, you know, you, people get the book of Matthew and let's just start at the New Testament and understand it. Listen, you just missed three quarters of the book if you start in Matthew, okay? Because this book starts in Genesis. And if you just don't, if you start in Matthew and you get to chapter 3 and you read this thing about John, you're like, who's John the Baptist? You know, well, matter of fact, who's Yeshua that it talks about in chapter 1? Well, if you go back and get the first three quarters, then you'll understand it. So the Bible is one book, and well, there's no way you're going to understand it if you start in the New Testament without the background there. So he doesn't give any background, he just introduces the greatest of the First Testament prophets in Matthew 3 1. He says, now in those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, so John comes on the scene as a prophet of Yahweh after 400 years of silence. Let me give you a little background here so you can understand the significance of John's appearance in relation to the second coming. See, the first testament canon of scripture deal, closes with the book of Malachi. And the book of Malachi is one long Terrible impeachment of the nation Israel. Malachi is the prophet of doom. Coming judgment is the burden of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. Look at Malachi 3, 5. He says, then I will draw near to you for judgment. This is why God is coming. He's coming for judgment. And I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers and the adulterers, and against those who swear falsely, and against those who oppose the wage earner in his wages, the widow and the orphan. Boy, this is a theme throughout the First Testament. God defends the widow and the orphan. That's because they have no one to defend them. So he becomes a father to the fatherless, a husband to those who have none. And those who turn aside the alien and do not fear me, thus says the Lord of hosts. In 4.1, he says, For behold, the day is coming, burning like a furnace. That's a picture of judgment. And all the arrogant and every evildoer will be chaff. And the day that is coming will set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, 
so it will leave them neither root nor branch. That this is not a vague and meaningless threat is evident from the very distinct and very definite terms that it uses to an Everything points to an approaching crisis in the history of the nation Israel when God is going to inflict judgment upon them because of the rebellion. Now the day, he says, is coming. And he says, that day shall be burning like a furnace. This period is more precisely defined as the great and terrible day of the Lord in Malachi 4.5. Behold, I'm going to send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. Now, that, that this day refers to a certain period and a specific event, I think it's clear. Yeshua tells us that the predicted Elijah was to come before the great and terrible day of the Lord. And, that, the, and it, the Lord tells us that this Elijah was in fact, who? John the Baptist. Look what he says in Matthew eleven fourteen. 14. And if you are willing to accept it, John himself is Elijah who was to come. So we see in Malachi that Elijah comes before the judgment, and now we see that Yeshua is saying John is Elijah. So the judgment can come now because he's there. This enables us to determine the time of the event that's referred to as the great and terrible day of the Lord. It must be in the time period of John the Baptist. That's when the coming of the Lord is to be. And it seems clear that the allusion is to the, the judgment of the Jewish nation. And I think the allusion here to judgment is to the judgment of Jerusalem that happened in AD 70 when the city and the temple were destroyed and the entire fabric of Judaism was dissolved. Now Malachi represents John as the precursor of the coming judge. Look at Malachi 3.1. Behold, I'm going to send my messenger, and he will clear the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. And the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. Now that this is a coming to judgment, I think is clear from the words which follow describing the alarm and dismay that's caused by his appearing. Look at verse 2. But who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and a fuller's soap. Now this is not talking about Christ's first coming, but his second coming. And there is a distinct allusion to this passage in Revelation 6. It says, Then the king of the earth, then the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the commanders, and the rich, and the strong, and every slave and free man will hide themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains. And they will say to the mountains and to the rocks, Fall on us, hide us from the presence of him who sits on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great and terrible day of the wrath has come, and who can stand? So the great day of his wrath in Revelation 6.17, we see that this is what the prophet Malachi speaks about. Not the first coming, but the second. And the second coming is to be a time period it happened during the time period of John the Baptist. Now that Malachi is speaking of Christ's second coming, I think is further proved by the significant fact that in chapter 3.1, the Lord is represented as suddenly coming to His temple, which according to verse 2, is an occasion of terror and dismay. Who can endure the day of His coming? This expression speaks of His second coming in judgment. And that's what we have to understand. That's what the second coming was about. It's a time of judgment. The temple was the center of the nation's life. It was the visible symbol of the covenant between them and Yahweh, His people. And it was the spot where judgment had to begin. And which was to be overtaken by sudden destruction, he says. So the sudden coming of the Lord to His temple, the dismay attending the day of His coming as a refiner's fire. It was near the day coming that shall burn as a furnace, burning up the wicked root and branch. And the appearance of John the Baptist, the second Elijah, would happen previous to the arrival of the great and terrible day of the Lord. Now that makes it clear that the prophet Malachi here foretells the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. I think if you go back and examine Malachi, that's what he's talking about. 
He's not talking about an end of the world sometime way off in the distant future. He's talking to Israel about their destruction. We need to understand that Malachi's prophecy has a distinct and a specific reference to Israel. And that's sometimes what our problem is. You know, we get away from the idea of hermeneutics and we read Malachi and say, see, this, this is coming. Well, that's written to Israel. The message of the prophet is to Israel. The sins that are condemned are the sins of Israel. And the coming of the Lord to His temple is to the temple in Israel. And the land threatened with a curse is Israel. <laughs> All this points to a specific local and national catastrophe. And history records the fulfillment of that prophecy in exact correspondence to time, place, and circumstances. In the destruction of Jerusalem in A.D. 70. Now the four centuries between the conclusion of the First Testament and the beginning of the New Testament are a blank in scriptural history. Now when I say scriptural history, the Maccabees talk about that, but I'm not counting the Maccabees as scripture because they're not in the canon. Good history, they're not in the canon. I just take it that God put the canon together how He wants it, that we would have what He wants us to have, so I accept the Bible we have as the full canon of Scripture. Now, if you want to read other books, the Pseudopigrapha and these other writings outside, like I said, there might be some good history. I just wouldn't lean too strongly on them. And I've seen over and over people who seem to lean too strongly on them end up leaving the faith. Now, during this period, this 400-year period, that's the time when the synagogues were really established throughout the land. And the knowledge of the Scripture was being widely extended because, you know, of the synagogue where they had the Scriptures. The great religious schools of the Pharisees and the Sadducees arose at this time, both professing to be expounders and defenders of the law of Moses. See, the remnant is trying to protect the law of God. Above all, the nation cherished the hope of a coming deliverer. Israel was looking for that, an offspring of the royal house of David who would be the theocratic king, the liberator of Israel from the Gentile dominion. But for the most part, the popular conception of the coming king was earthly and carnal. There had not in 400 years been any improvement in the moral condition of the people. And between the formalists of the Pharisees and the skepticism of the Sadducees, True religion had sunk to its lowest level. Now, you know what the Sadducees believe? Okay, there's no resurrection. You know how to remember that, right? They don't believe in the resurrection. That's why they are sad, you see. Okay? I mean, if you don't believe in a resurrection, that's a reason to be sad. You know, there's no hope. There's nothing. All right? There's still, however, a faithful remnant in Israel who had truer conceptions of the kingdom of heaven, who looked for the redemption of Israel. And the time was drawing near. And there were indications of a return of the prophetic spirit and premonitions that the promised deliverer was at hand. Simeon received assurance that before his death, he would see the Lord's anointed. And a similar revelation seems to have been made to the aged prophetess Anna. And such revelation, it seems reasonable to suppose, must have awakened the eager expectations of the hearts of many who prepared them for the cry that would soon be heard in the wilderness of Judea. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. A prophet, again, had been risen up in Israel after this 400 years of silence. And listen, there is nothing more distinctly affirmed in the New Testament than the identity of John the Baptist as Elijah of Malachi. That is clear. At least it is to me, but it seems like it's not to a lot of people. Well, a lot of people miss that. Let's look at a couple of scriptures. Matthew 17, 10-13. And his disciples ask him, Why then do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? And he answered and said, Elijah is coming and will restore all things. But I say to you that Elijah already came. Now think of the time period here. He's talking, all right? And they did not recognize him, but did to him whatever they wished. So also the Son of Man is going to suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood, the light's coming on, that He spoke to them of John the Baptist. See, the disciples knew the prophecy about Elijah. 
Apparently, they thought it was going to be fulfilled physically, right? Obviously, that's what they're looking for. Now, this is a good principle of hermeneutics here because it was actually fulfilled, but it was not physically fulfilled. And Jesus is teaching that here, all right? It's actually fulfilled, but not physically. John came in the spirit of Elijah, speaking to Zacharias and his wife Elizabeth about John. The angel says this, it is he who will go as a forerunner before him in the spirit and power of Elijah. All right, he's speaking of John. He's going to go in the spirit. He's going to go in the power of Elijah. Now watch what he says he's going to do. To turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children. Where's that from? Anybody know? Malachi 4.6. All right. Again, we're right back to Malachi. We're quoting it because this is John is being connected with Elijah. And the disobedient to the attitude of the righteous, and as to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. So the Jews expected the reappearance of the literal Elijah. I mean, that's, they just figured this is a prophecy that's going to literally be fulfilled. But we're being taught here in the New Testament by Yeshua that that's a mistaken notion. It's not going to be a literal well, let me take that back. It is a literal. It's not a physical. And I think we have to make that distinction. It, it, it's really happening. It's just not physical. They asked him, what then? Are you Elijah? See, John's being questioned now. He says, are you Elijah? And he said, I'm not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, no. And you're like, well, this is confusing here. What do you mean you're not? Yeshua is telling them, if they want to understand the second coming of Elijah, you've got to look at the spiritual. John, he, John was not Elijah, but he was the fulfillment of the prophecy of Elijah. Look at Matthew 11, 13 and 14. For all the prophets in the law prophesied until John, and if you are willing to accept it, John himself is Elijah, who was to come. So we see that John the Baptist is the fulfillment of the prophecy of the coming of Elijah Remember, Malachi said that Elijah was to come when? Before the great and terrible day of the Lord. So this has been fulfilled now. John is here before the great and terrible day, so then it can come at any time now. All right, let's go back to our text. Now, in those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. Now, this, this wilderness of Judea indicates the rolling badlands between the hill country of Judea and to the west and the Dead Sea to the lower Jordan to the east. It stretches northward about the point of the where the Jabbok River flows into the Jordan. It's a really desolate expanse of barren, chalky soil covered with pebbles, broken stones, and rocks. Now, interestingly, John did not go to the city of Jerusalem. Doesn't that seem weird? Here comes the prophet after four years of silence, and you think, you know, he's going to go right to the capital city, Go right to the heart. Go into the temple and preach. You'd think that's a messenger proclaiming the introduction of the king would go there and make that proclamation. But he doesn't. He went to the wilderness. And here's what's interesting. The people flocked to him in order to hear him. His ministry of preaching indicates he's a herald, one who is giving a message to proclaim or announce. A herald announced the coming of a king. And that's what John's doing. He is giving, that's his ministry, announcing the coming presence of Yeshua, who is the Christ. He comes preaching with a proclamation. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And John told them that the reason it was so crucial for them to repent, because the kingdom of heaven was at hand. It's an expression meaning it's drawing near. The same expression is used later in the gospel as Yeshua was drawing near to Jerusalem. Now, it's often people look at this expression, you know, it's at hand, and they say, well, yeah, that was a couple thousand years. Well, Yeshua was not a couple thousand years away from Jerusalem. He's drawing near. It's something that's close. It's at hand. It indicates that something's on the verge of coming. John is telling them they need to repent because the kingdom is very near. A kingdom is going to be set up by the Messiah. Now, we're all familiar with this form of First Testament Scripture. The Jews knew that the first thing that would occur in the kingdom was judgment. 
a judgment of those who had not repented. They were so familiar with those facts that John didn't even have to go into the details from the First Testament. They knew that the kingdom would be set up by Messiah, who would begin by judging the rebels in the nation and excluding them from the kingdom. Matthew describes the appearance of John, and even his dress is reminiscent of the prophetic ministry. Look what he says in verse 4. Now John himself had a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Why is he talking to us about his diet and his clothes? What do we need to know about that from John? What he is doing here is he, has, he is identifying this prophet with Elijah. See, Elijah's ministry to Ahaziah is recorded in 2 Kings 1. If you remember the story, the king was ill following an injury, and he decided to inquire from false gods if he's going to recover. Now, here's the king of Israel said, let me go to some false gods. You know, this is why God judged this nation, okay? They, they just really are messed up. But Elijah, the prophet of Yahweh, intercepted his messengers, okay? In 2 Kings 1, 3, and 4, it says, But the angel of the Lord said to Elijah the Tishbite, Arise, go to meet the messengers of the king of Samaria, and say to them, It is because there is no God in Israel that you are going to inquire of Baalzebub, the god of Ekron? Now therefore, thus says the Lord, you shall not come down from the bed where you are gone up, but you shall surely die. Then Elijah departed. Now after Ahaziah was told that he would die, the king asked for a description of the man who gave this. Well, who was it that told you this? What did this guy look like? And they answered him and said, he was a hairy man with a leather girdle bound about his loins. And he said, it is Elijah, the Tishbite. Now, since the prophet has this hairy garment bound with a leather girdle about his waist, the king immediately recognizes this is the dress of the prophet Elijah. So when Matthew describes the dress of John, he identifies him with the prophetic office of Elijah and his ministry. And after describing John's clothing and diet in verse 4, Matthew proceeds to describe the response of the people to his message. Then Jerusalem was going out to him in all Judea and the district around the Jordan. You know, we can read over this, and that's just cool. They're going out to hear John. We get a little background on this, and it becomes very exciting. And if you want to understand the significance of what's happening here, you've got to get the picture of the landscape. Many commentators estimate that there would have been between 200,000 to 500,000 people who participated in John's ministry. And Matthew is not describing the appearance here of about a half a dozen people. You know, John's got all about 12 guys following him around. No, this is a huge crowd. The prophet comes on the scene in such a striking way that after the Spirit of God had prepared the people's heart, the whole nation, you know, it's been 400 years, we're quiet, and we're waiting. Here's a man announcing the king, and so the people are just pouring out. And the leaders even feared him after his death because he, people had such high regard for the prophet. The trip from Jerusalem to the Jordan River was about 20 miles. Not on a road, okay, in the wilderness. It was an incredible hike. It was a 4,000 foot drop. So if you can imagine a 20 mile hike, and along the way you don't stop at 7-Eleven and pick anything up, okay, you're out in the middle of nowhere. These people got what they got, the food what they got, and they're going out. I mean, they're committed to this. So 4,000 foot drop, 20 miles, and then they got to go back, okay? Think about that. And they're doing this, why? To hear a man preach. Why are they doing this? Because the Spirit of God is working, people. You know, the church today does everything in the world to get people in the doors. Except preach the Word of God <laughs> and pray that God would do something. You know, we're so busy in attracting them, then when they come, we've got nothing to give them. And we've got to give them the Word of God. And listen, when God is behind something, you know, I don't think John was seeker-friendly. Okay? I really don't. I mean, he's out in the middle of the wilderness. What a place to preach. Who's going to go out there? You know, you've got to make the people comfortable. You've got to give them Starbucks coffee and a little show so they'll come and feel comfortable. John didn't get any of that stuff. He just got out there and just, you know, and his message wasn't too seeker-friendly either. What did he say? But when they saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to the baptism, he said to them, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Does that sound seeker-sensitive? 
He's dressed as a prophet with the message of a prophet, and he acts like a prophet. The Pharisees and the Sadducees had great pride in their religious tradition. And John calls them, you bunch of snakes. Now, the interesting thing is these vipers could, if you remember the story from Paul in Acts, he's picking up the sticks and there's a viper in the bundle because they could just lay there and look like a stick. You know, they're brown and you pick them up and then all of a sudden there's this venom and they attack. And John told the religious leaders, you're just like vipers. You're deceptive. You look harmless. You look good, but you're deadly. And such charges from John were tremendously offensive to the Pharisees and Sadducees. So here's a guy preaching out in the middle of the desert, and he's offending people who come to hear him preach. <laughs> he knew something we don't know. And again, it's because this is a movement of God, people. You know, some of you say, we've got to try to do another reformation. Well, you better get in touch with God to do that, because that's all. You know, Martin Luther didn't, you know, it wasn't him. He did, I think I'll start a reformation. That wasn't even in his mind. When he nailed that 95 Theses to the church door, that was all about indulgences. He said, I'm sick of these indulgences. The 95 Theses deals with indulgences. It just happened that God used that, boom, to start a reformation. It was a work of God. And if you want things to change, we need to pray for a work of God. You know, it's not our tricks. It's not our gimmicks. It's not whatever we do. It's the work of God. So speaking to the Pharisees and Sadducees, John says, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? And the interesting thing here is John uses the word, the Greek word mellow. Who warned you to free, flee from the wrath about to come? That's what mellow means. It means about to. It means to be on the point of. If you see, look at Thayer, Art and Gingrich, they make it very clear. So John is saying, listen, to the first century audience, who warned you to flee from a wrath that is about to come? And the wrath that John was talking about was the destruction of Jerusalem, the same wrath that Malachi was talking about. So John's trying to teach them that the physical relationships were inadequate because these Jews are hanging on the physical. John put his finger right on the problem when he says this, Do not suppose that you can say to yourselves, We have Abraham for our father. For I say to you that from these stones God is able to raise up children to Abraham. Boy, that had to be an insult to him, didn't it? These Jews had been taught and had believed that every physical descendant of Abraham was going into the kingdom. All they had to do was be a descendant of Abraham, and they were sure. They had to be circumcised, and they would be secure. But John informed them that being a physical descendant of Abraham has nothing to do with getting in the kingdom. See, they, again, they're focused on the physical. And he said, this is spiritual. God could turn stones into children of Abraham. He said they had no more chance than stones than getting in just because of their physical relationship to Abraham. Now what I want you to see this morning is that the heart of John's message was the theme of coming judgment. He's heralding the king, but he's proclaiming judgment. John announced in verse 2 that the kingdom of heaven, meaning is very near, the kingdom of heaven will be ushered in with a time of judgment. And he speaks of judgment in verse 10. He says the acts is already laid at the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Now, you know he's not really talking about trees here. He's talking about the fruit that Israel was to be producing. In order for the kingdom to be consummated, there had to be a time of judgment. And the axe, he says, already ready to cut down the tree that's not bearing fruit. John places the emphasis on fire in verses 11 and 12. And in those verses, there's a reference to the coming Destruction. Now, several First Testament prophets predicted judgment preceding the glory of the kingdom. And that is why John is warning that the axe is already laid to the root of the trees. Because of the teaching of the prophets, the Jews knew that the kingdom was to be ushered in by a time of judgment. Isaiah wrote this, chapter 4. When the Lord has washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion and purge the bloodshed of Jerusalem from her midst by the spirit of judgment and the spirit of burning, then the Lord will create over the whole area of Mount Zion and over her assemblies a cloud by day, even smoke and brightness of a flaming fire by night, for over all the glory will be a canopy. See, the order is first comes judgment, then there's glory. 
Ezekiel wrote about the bringing in of the nation Israel back and establishing them in the kingdom in Ezekiel 34. He says, I will seek the lost, bring back the scattered, bind up the broken and strengthen the sick. But first there has to be a time of judgment. He says, but the fat and the strong I will destroy. I will feed them with judgment. See, the fat and the strong have been feeding on the weak, so they're going to face the judgment. Judgment's a key element here. Malachi, the last prophet in Israel until the time of John the Baptist, prophesied the judgment and the burning in Malachi 4, 1 and 2. For behold, the day is coming, burning like a furnace, and all the arrogant and every evildoer will be chaff, and the day that is coming will set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. But for you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness will arise with healing in His wings, and you will go forth and skip about like calves from the stall. So in these passages, it's hard to miss the whole emphasis here that's on judgment. Now the Jews of John's day, they knew these prophecies in the New Testament, or the First Testament, and they understood that before the kingdom is consummated, God's judgment is going to fall on the unbelievers who would be rooted out of the kingdom as Messiah establishes His rule and His reign. Back to Matthew in verse 11, he says, As for me, John speaking, I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, I am not fit to remove his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Now, I want you to understand, this, this prophecy here in Matthew 3.11 is talking about an event, the Christ event. He's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit. When did that happen? Pentecost. All right? He's going to baptize you with fire. When did that happen? Holocaust. 40 years later in the destruction of Jerusalem. So we've got a 40-year period that he's prophesying about. A generation. 40 years. Starts at Pentecost, ends at Holocaust. Another 40-year period just like the Exodus. This is another Exodus. This is a second Exodus. This is a spiritual Exodus from the sin and death and to the kingdom of God. He's going to baptize you with fire. John mentions in verse 11 is the judgment that he elaborates on in verse 12. Look at verse 12. His fork is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clear his threshing floor. He will gather his wheat into the barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Now he's going to winnow the grain until the chaff is gone. The judgment's going to be thorough, it's going to be complete, and he's going to gather the wheat into the barn. And then the warning again but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. See, judgment precedes the kingdom. Now, in Matthew 13, where Yeshua gives all these parables, he explains the parable of the wheat and tares. And this passage is kind of preparatory to the setting of the kingdom where the angels will come and remove the wicked. This is parallel to Matthew 24, where the two will be in the fields, one's taken and one's left. But here's what you got to understand. In the context of these, the one taken is not raptured to heaven, the one taken is taken to judgment. Look at Matthew 13. The Son of Man will send forth His angels and they will gather out of His kingdom all the stumbling blocks. Those who commit lawlessness, they will throw them into the furnace of fire. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. All right, when Yeshua says the angels are going to come forth and separate the wicked from among the just and cast them into the furnace of fire. Now watch, He says it's going to happen when? At the end of the age. Now, if you've got a King James Bible, and I don't think too many of you do, it says the end of the world. And that's, is that different in your mind anyway? The world ending, the age ending? Listen, the Bible does not talk about the end of the world unless it's translated wrong, okay? The word here is I own, it's age. To the Jews, time was divided into two great periods, the Mosaic Age, which they were living in, and the Messianic Age, which was the kingdom, the age to come. And the Messiah was viewed as the one who would bring in the new world. The period of the Messiah was therefore correctly characterized by the synagogue as the world to come. All through the New Testament, we see two ages in contrast, this age and the age to come. Let's look at one in Matthew 12, 32. Whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it shall not be forgiven him, either in this age or in the age to come. So there's two ages. Now, the problem is, and this again is a problem with hermeneutics, 
Christians read this, and they read the age to come, and they're thinking, well, I can't wait for that age to come. No, this was written 2,000 years ago, and the age was very near then. It's over. We live in the age to come. So the age that was the end was the Jewish age. It would end with the destruction of the temple. That makes sense. It did not happen at the cross. That cross wasn't the end. Pentecost wasn't the end. The destruction of Jerusalem was the end. The world was not going to end, but Judaism was. The disciples knew that the fall of the temple and the destruction of the city meant the first covenant age is being inaugurated. The new age is coming into being in its fullness. J. Stuart Russell, who over a century ago, says this, These warnings of John the Baptist are not the vague and indefinite exhortations to repentance addressed to men in all ages. You get that? That's so important. He's writing to a specific people, which, which they are sometimes assumed to be. They are urgent, burning words having a specific and present bearing upon then existing men to whom he brought the message of God. The Jewish nation was, was now upon its last trial. The second Elijah had come, precursor of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. If they rejected his warnings, the doom predicted by Malachi speedily and speedily fall. Come and smite the land with the curse. Nothing can be more obvious than that the catastrophic catastrophe to which John alludes is particular, national, local, and eminent. And history tells us that within the period of the generation that listened to this warning cry, wrath came upon them to the uttermost. John is one of judgment. And it is to first century Israel, Messiah, the judge is coming. You need to repent. The coming of Christ Listen, people, it's not in our future. It is in our past. He returned in AD 70 and brought judgment upon the nation, putting an end to the Old Covenant and bringing in the New. And all through the New Testament, we hear the, you know, the idea of the age to come, the church, the, new, the kingdom, the new heavens and the new earth. Those are all synonyms for the New Covenant. Well, as we proceed through Matthew, let's grab one more verse before we go. We got time? Yeah, we got time. The next verse that we come to that really gives us a time indicator is found in Matthew 10. And here Christ says that he was his disciples. Notice what he tells them. Whenever they persecute you in one city, flee to the next. For truly I say to you, you will not finish going through the cities of Israel till the Son of Man comes. Now, to understand this verse, the first thing we have to understand is who is Yeshua talking to? Who is the you here? Whenever they persecute you, again, Christians get this, they read the Bible like it's a newspaper. Wow, when they persecute you, i got to go to a different city. Wait, wait, wait. This was written 2,000 years ago, and he's speaking to a specific people, but who is he speaking to? To find out who he's speaking to, just back up in the text. Let's back up to the first verse of one. Yeshua summoned the twelve. Oh, that's who he's talking to the twelve disciples, and he gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and heal every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. So he calls his disciples and he begins to talk to them. Verse 5, These twelve Yeshua sent out after instructing them, Do not go into the way of the Gentiles, and do not enter any city of the Samaritans. So there's no doubt to who he's talking to. He calls the twelve, and now he sends the twelve. And then he instructs them. In verse 17 and 18, Beware of men. For they will hand you over to courts and scourge you in their synagogue, and you will even be brought before governors and kings for my sake as a testimony to them and to the Gentiles. These events actually happened to the disciples. They took place. They were scourged in the synagogue. Yeshua warned the twelve that they would be brought before government officials because of their testimony for him in verses 19 through 22. And then he says this in verse 23. But whenever they persecute you, in one city, just flee to the next. And I want to tell you something. You're not going to finish going through all the cities of Israel until I come. So who is Yeshua talking to here? He's talking to the twelve. That's really clear from the context. He didn't switch from talking to the twelve to talking to the 
future generation. And I don't know what kind of hermeneutic that is. You know, he was talking to the twelve, but he's really talking to us. Well, then did it have any meaning to them? If he's talking about coming to relieve their persecution, and he wasn't really talking to them, then guess what? He's deceiving them or lying to them or whatever. Throughout this discourse, Yeshua has the present audience in mind. He uses the second person plural throughout the discourse to make this point more than clear. There's nothing in the passage that gives any indication that Yeshua has any other audience in view than His immediate audience. Now to most Christians who read the Bible like you doesn't mean the twelve in the first century. You means us in our century. But understanding the hermeneutical principle of audience relevance, we know that you means the twelve that's who he's talking to. That's who this has meaning to. And, you know, I say this, and I know some Christians get offended at this, but the Bible's not written to you. It's not. It's written for you. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God as profitable doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, righteousness, that the man or woman of God may be perfect, thoroughly complete, fulfilled for all good works. But it's not written to you. As I said, there's not a book to the Christians in Tidewater. He wrote to the Galatians and he had very specific instruction. He wrote to the Philippians and he says, I beseech Yodia, I beseech Syntyche. Be of the same mind. How would you like to be in that congregation? You know, they're all gathered for the reading of the letter. And listen, this private reading that we do, that was not, the Jews didn't do that. First century didn't do that. It was always a public reading. And, and so the, the angel of the synagogue is standing up and he's reading the letter. And then he comes to Yodia and Syntyche and they're like, you know, scotch, be of the same mind. Stop that fighting. I want some unity in that church. Can you? Aren't you glad the Bible's written? <laughs> You're not going to get any discourse directed right at you. But we have to understand that. He wrote to particular people in particular circumstances. And listen, you know, the letter to Ephesians was a circular letter. It went to many churches. But it's, it's not written to us, but it is written for us. And we have to, but before we can take the Scriptures and apply it to ourselves, First of all, we have to know what did it mean to its original audience. What did it mean to them? And then we can apply it to ourselves. And some scriptures just don't apply. You say, oh, well, that's just so sad. I'm sorry. But it had a first century audience in mind. And if it doesn't apply, you know, the, the exhortation of Yodi and Syntyche, he's appealing for unity. That's all through the New Testament. You know, he does want unity. All right? He tells Timothy, you know, bring sure, make sure you bring the manuscripts, you know? And he tells one of the church, he tells Philipp, the Philippian church, I'm going to send Timothy to you shortly. Same exact word he uses of his second coming. Timothy's coming shortly, and so is Yeshua. But I don't know of a Christian today who's looking for the coming of Timothy. Not one. And I ask him that. Well, are you waiting for Timothy? Well, no, that's stupid. Why? Paul says right here in Philippians, I'm sending Timothy to you shortly. Well, that was then. <laughs> That, see, you can apply principles of hermeneutics sometimes, but other times, for Timothy it applies, for Yeshua it doesn't. Why is that? Well, Matthew 10.23, I think, makes it clear that Yeshua is talking about His second coming as the Son of Man. And He says, you not have gone through all the cities of Israel before the Son of Man comes. And the phrase here, the Son of Man, comes from Daniel 7.23. It refers to the Son of Man being presented before the angel of days, Yeshua is saying to his 12 disciples that they will not have fled through all the cities of Israel, running from persecution until the Son of Man comes. This is a promise of deliverance. Because their persecutors are who? Jews. And what happens in 87? The temple shut down. The sac Judaism is put to death. All right? It's done. They're not being persecuted by the Jews any longer. This seems clear. And simple. So why do so many Christians miss it? I think you're all aware that our paradigms can blind us from certain truths. I mean, we have these paradigms in our mind, and when we read Scripture, too often we'll take Scripture and twist it into our paradigm. There, that fits. Instead of, you know, because the Scripture sometimes messes up your paradigm. Well, when it messes up your paradigm, don't throw out the Scripture, throw out your paradigm. Just rebuild it in a different way, okay? Have a paradigm shift, all right? If in your eschatological paradigm you see the second coming of Christ as an end of the physical world, a cataclysmic, earth-burning, total destruction as we know it, you're going to miss the coming of Yeshua. All right? You're going to just miss it. 
Because life goes on, you can't believe that Yeshua will return. Well, th this can't be the new heavens and new earth. Why not? What are you looking for? It don't, doesn't fit your paradigm. That was my problem when I first came to see this. I said, so this is the new heaven and new earth? Well, if you go back and look at Galatians 4, he makes it real clear. The new covenant is the coming of the new heavens and earth. Let's look at a verse that shatters this paradigm, I think, that the second coming is the end of the world. And that's found in Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians 2. Now watch what he says. Now, and again, he's writing to the Thessalonians and he's writing to them in the first century. Now we request you, brethren, with regard to the coming of our Lord Yeshua the Christ. All right, so that's what he's talking about, the second coming. And our gathering together to him that you not be quickly shaken from your composure or be disturbed either by spirit or a messenger or a letter. I don't want you know, to hear rumors to get a letter saying it's a, to the effect, watch, that the day of the Lord come. See, they were hearing these stories that the Lord had returned. The day of the Lord was over. Now, think with, it, think with me here for a minute. A little logic. If the Thessalonians believed that the nature of the second coming was an earth-burning, total destruction of the planet, how could they ever be deceived about that? <laughs> how do you get, you know, how do they miss that? You know, well, no, it's the, the thing's going to fall apart. I mean, the earth's going to be burned up and everything's going to be changed. You know, Paul could have written to the Thessalonians and simply said this, look out the window. Trees are still there. People are still there. Nothing's changed. The earth is still here. It's obvious the Lord hasn't come. They thought it had happened already, so they must have viewed the nature of the second coming differently than we do. And just like the first century people looked for the coming of Elijah as physical, our nation, our culture today, the church today, looks for the second coming to be physical. And that's why they missed it. And it's the same reason that the people in Yeshua's day missed the first coming. <laughs> you know, they wanted a physical taking over. Let's beat up Rome. Let's take over. And it didn't happen, so they just missed it. The first century Thessalonians were looking for the second coming of Christ, and they were concerned that they might have missed it. <coughs> but when Yeshua talked to the twelve about the coming of the Son of Man, they did not understand this to mean a future return. And here's something you have to understand. When he's talking to the disciples, first of all, you know they're confused most of the time. They don't get it. What are you talking about? What's it? Why is this happening? When he's talking about the coming of the Son of Man, they didn't view that as a second coming. Because they didn't understand he was leaving. They never knew he was leaving. They didn't, you know, remember, they couldn't grasp that concept. So what did they understand when he talked about this? Well, that's a good question. He says, you will not finish going to the cities until the Son of Man comes. The answer is in the understanding of the Jewish concept of the parousia. The word meant arrival or presence, not return. It didn't refer to any future return of Christ. To the disciples, the parousia of the Son of Man signified the full manifestation of His Messiahship, His glorious appearing in power. So they didn't know He was going. They just looked for Him to show Himself in power. They believed He was the Messiah, but they wanted Him, let's see the glory. William Barclay says of the parousia, regular word for the arrival of a governor into his province or for the coming of a king to his subject. It regularly describes a coming in authority and power. See, they didn't know he was leaving, but they looked for a time when he would appear in full glory and power, bringing the kingdom and judging God's enemies, and that happened. The power was clearly demonstrated in AD 70. And you know, if you read some of the historians of the day, Josephus and Tacitus, they actually talk about physical signs in the heaven above the temple as the temple was being destroyed. And these are not Christians, okay? They're not trying to support what Yeshua was teaching. They're just saying, historians saying, this is, you know, this thing's marvelous. Things are happening. And from Matthew 10, 23, I think it's clear that this was to happen in their lifetime. This is a very strong and very clear time reference as to when the second coming is to occur. Now the question you need to answer is, do you believe Yeshua? See, he told the twelve that his second coming would happen in their lifetime. And they had to flee to the cities of Israel. Now if you believe Yeshua, 
you must believe that he kept his word and he returned in the first century. And when I came to really understand this, I think that was one of the things that was so encouraging to me. We have a God who keeps his word. You know, because I've been really talked out of my faith because all these time texts, the New Testament is just so loaded with them. Soon, quickly, shortly, this generation, some of you standing here, that it's hard to, you know, but we're taught out of that. It can't mean what it says. And you get guys like C.S. Lewis who say, this is the most embarrassing verse in the Bible. You know? He says, Yeshua obviously was wrong. What was he, what else was he wrong about then? Is he really my Savior? No, we know that when he says something, he means it, and if he said soon, that's what he meant. You say, well, that does, just doesn't fit my paradigm. Okay, then just change your paradigm. Let's pray. <laughs> Father, I thank you this morning for the opportunity just to look at your word. Lord, some of these concepts are so difficult, so foreign to us. Again, I pray you give us the hearts of Bereans, Lord, that we would not accept things, we would not reject things without first investigating them, studying them, see if they are so. Father, I thank you that you keep your word, that we can count on you the things you say are true. We don't have to try to build a framework around and under, try to understand why you didn't come when you said you would. We can believe it happened. Thank you, Lord, for that confidence. You are faithful. We thank you. We rest in that. In the name of Yeshua, we pray. Amen.